to episode two of Target Sighters. My name is Mike from Objective Secured, and today we're going to be talking about the Eldari Shining Spears Aspect Warriors. The Shining Spears were first introduced to Warhammer 40,000 back in third edition with the uh, new Codex Eldar, and were a hybrid plastic metal kit using the older sort of uh, chopper style Aspect Warrior jet bike combo. So the uh, model kits up until 9th edition have remained the same, although they had moved from fine ca- uh, metal to fine cast. The artwork that I can find for them online all is the same in that it does represent the older style jet bikes and riders, and they were very much a knight mounted on a horseback style feel. They were sat back in the saddle and they carry the iconic laser lance. So they are very much the crusading knight style for the craft world Eldari forces. Their actual role on the battlefield hasn't changed much over the years, and they essentially form a shock assault style unit. They are fast, they are relatively durable when compared to most Eldari units, they hit very hard and there aren't too many of them and they don't really like being hit back too much. What has happened in 9th edition however is they have been given a sideways movement in the way that you can use them. In the past, in prior editions, particularly 8th, we had a situation where you could double move them using the Psychic Power Quicken and you could have squads of up to 9, which made them really powerful when they charged something. They also, because they didn't have an updated model, tended to sit on the 32 mil smaller bases. With 9th edition, however, and the changes to the Psychic Powers, you now can't double move them with Quicken if you still want to charge. And they're now on the 60 mil large bases, which makes them a lot more difficult to get multiple models into combat, particularly if you go over the 5 or 6. Now, thankfully, they changed it so the unit size caps out at 6. So that's a blessing and a curse. The Shining Spears themselves, though, uh, have a lot going for them, and I think a lot of people tend to have written them off. And I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the experiences I've had with using them in tournaments prior to the recording this, and also talk about what I'm hoping to do with them in the future. But first of all, let's take a look at what we're dealing with. The Shining Spears are a squad, like I said, of up to six models, one X-Arch and two to five Shining Spears. Have a movement rate of 16 inches, a weapon skill with six skill three plus, strength three, toughness four, two wounds base, three attacks base, leadership eight and a three plus save. The X-Arch picks up an extra wound and an extra attack. They come equipped with a laser lance and twin shuriken catapults as standard. Now the shuriken catapults should be familiar to anyone who's familiar with the Eldari. They're an eight and inch range. In this case, Assault 4, Strength 4, minus 1 AP, 1 damage with the Shuriken Rule. The Shuriken Rule meaning, of course, when you roll a 6 to wound, you add 2 to the AP, making them minus 3. The Laser Lance is a twin profile weapon for melee and shooting. Shooting, it's a Strength 6, minus 4 AP, 2 damage, Assault 1 weapon with a 6 inch range. And in melee, it is a plus 1 Strength, minus 4 AP, 2 damage weapon. However, on the turn you charge, the attack has a Strength characteristic of plus 3 instead of plus 1, making them Strength 6. Now, at its core, if you just leave them completely standard at 35 points a model for the six of them, you've got a 210 point unit that puts out quite a significant number of attacks. It's 19 in total base. Now, that's 15 from the five regular guys and then four from the Exarch. Now, that alone at strength six minus four, two damage is enough to give anyone a little bit of pause. But it's when you add the Exarch and start changing the role of the unit through uh, different uh, Exarch powers, relics, and certainly stratagems that you really get to feel just how good these Shining Spears could potentially be. The Exarch has a few different options. Firstly, he can be given a Shimmer Shield to give him a 4 plus invulnerable save. Now, the squad still has Aspect Armor, which makes them a 5 plus invulnerable save, save standard. However, I wasn't a convert to that 5 point spend, and I don't think it's essential. But having seen the X-Arch tank hit after hit after hit in a couple of games now, I feel like that 4 plus is, if you're going to take these, these models in significant units to do damage, I think it's worth taking. The x can also swap his Shuriken Catapults for a single Shuriken Cannon, which again is a very familiar profile to anyone who plays Eldari. It's a 24 inch range, heavy 3, strength 6, minus 1 AP, 2 damage weapon with the Shuriken rule. But most importantly, he can swap his Laser Lance for either a Paragon Saber or a Star Lance. The Star Lance is the, and has been, the default option for as long as I can remember it. It has a very similar profile to the Laser Lance in that it is a multi-weapon, in that it can be used in the shooting phase or the combat phase. And it has the same basic profile 
save for the fact that in shooting, instead of strength 6, it's strength 8. And in combat, instead of plus 3 on the charge, it's plus 5, making him strength 8. So, the Star Lance for the 10 points is an expensive upgrade, but it's certainly a welcome one in terms of upping that damage profile high enough that, you know, you're going to be wounding anything toughness 4 or less on 2s. You present a 3 plus to wound against pretty much everything else in the game other than toughness 8. And thankfully, T8 models aren't too common at the moment. The unit also contains um, three other special rules apart from aspect armor. Um, four, sorry. Battle focus and strands of fate, which are pretty standard to every Eldar army. Ride the wind, which means they auto advance six inches, so you don't have to worry about matchless agility for their stratagem for them. And aerobatic grace. Each time a range attack is made against this unit, subtract one from the hit roll. Now... This is a rule I often forget, I really need to get better at remembering it, because it's something that I find I don't generally let them get shot at, and it happens after I've charged with them. And I've already played lightning fast on them a lot of the time, which we'll talk about in a second. So it's really important to remember aerobatic grace makes them quite more durable at range. Like all uh, Aspect Warriors, they have the Eldari, Asagani, and Craftworld keywords, as well as... Biker, Fly, Core, Aspectoria, and Shining Spears for their standard keywords. Now, taken in isolation on their own, you're basically going to be paying 15 points more than a Wind Rider. And in terms of stat lines, you're, you're picking up some attacks, and you're obviously gaining the Laser Lance, the Invulnerable Save, and the minus one to hit. But 15 points does feel a little bit on the expensive side when compared to a Twin Catapult uh, Wind Rider. So what you have to do is actually look at them in the light of the multi-tool that they really are. Because you have the ability to treat them in a squad of six with twin catapults and a single shuriken cannon, much like you would wind riders. They're fast, they deliver a lot of shots. But what makes them so exceptional is the ability to then follow through on that and deliver killing blows to things. And that's what they're all about. So, how do we make them more powerful? Well, the first thing we do is we look at their exarch powers. The Shining Spears have three Exarch powers, and I'll admit that uh, when I first read one of these, I was a bit disappointed. But having played with it now, and understanding it a bit better, I can see why I was uh, wrong when I first looked at them. Now you'll notice I haven't mentioned one of the weapons on the data sheet that we've talked about, which is the Paragon Saber. And the reason is it's going to tie into one of these Exarch powers in a second, so we'll wait for that one. The first Exarch power is Expert Lancers, it's 20 points for the squad. In the fight phase, each time a model in this unit makes an attack, if this unit made a charge move this turn and contains the Exarch, add one to the hit roll. This is great. 20 points plus one to hit means that the entire squad hits on twos. I don't think I can understate how good that is on a squad that is going to have that sort of 19 to 20 attacks where every hit matters. And I think if you're just going to take a Star Lance and take a squad of four to six, you'd take Expert Lances every time. The other good thing to mention before I go on any further is the Exarch powers obviously give the Exarch an extra attack and an extra wound, making him four wounds and five attacks base. He essentially turns into a mini character and it's really important that we leverage that as much as we possibly can. So by giving him an Exarch power, we do have a model that does start creeping into the 50 or 60 point territory, depending on what we give him. However, I think he is well worth it and... If all of his squad mates are dead, he still is a danger to independent characters and single models. The second Exarch power, which I think I would only take if I were taking three squads of uh, Shining Spears, is Lightning Attacks. Each time a model makes a consolidation move, if the unit contains an Exarch, it can move an additional six inches. So that's a nine inch consolidate move, which is pretty significant. Unfortunately for the Eldar, they don't have a stratagem that lets them fight twice. If they did, I think lightning attacks could be really good. And I think the only reason you'll be taking lightning attacks most of the time is, like I say, if you've got three squads of Exarch uh, Aspect Warriors and you want to make sure that all three Exarchs are dangerous in their own right. You're, you're basically paying the 20 points for the stat buffs at that point. Because while a consolidate move of nine is impressive, because it has to be towards the nearest enemy model, this doesn't have a caveat that lets you move in any direction, and you can't fight twice, um, while it will let you tag sort of tanks and things that will then potentially limit their firing and, you know, external firepower, you certainly don't want to go from combat unit to combat unit and then get killed in your own turn. The third ability which 
I originally I completely ignored until I played with it is Heart Strike. It's a 15 point upgrade which only affects the Exarch. Each time the Exarch model makes a melee attack, an unmodified wound roll of 5 plus inflicts one mortal wound on the target in addition to any normal damage. That in itself feels fairly innocuous until you look at what you actually get out of this power. And it wasn't until I started playing that, like I say, I've, I discovered just how dangerous this is. So with this um, power and combined with the Paragon Saber, the Paragon Saber is a plus one strength, minus four AP, one damage weapon. However, every time the bearer fights, he makes one additional attack with this weapon, bringing him up to a very, very respectable six attacks. And they'll be at weapon skill 3 plus and strength 4, minus 4 AP, 1 damage. That's already pretty good. Each time you attack with this weapon, you can re-roll the attacks hit roll and wound roll. Fantastic. So we've now got 6 attacks hitting on 3s with a re-roll. At strength 4, minus, one, uh, minus 4 AP, 1 damage with re-rolls to wound. That's already fantastic. But then we stack hard strike with that, meaning that any 5s we roll to wound inflict a mortal wound. So quite often what you'll have is a situation where the Exarch fights, rolls six attacks, will often... I've never had him hit less than five times, generally it's five or six. And because he's strength four, he's in this really interesting situation where most of the time you're wounding on fives anyway. I was certainly in my experience fighting enemy Wraith Guards, uh, Death Guard, a lot of the models you're seeing these days are minus one damage, which means obviously the two damage lances aren't necessarily as good. Uh, and they're often toughness five. So, every time we roll a 5, we get a mortal wound, and we still inflict a normal wound at minus 4 AP 1 damage. But we also get rerolls to wound, because of the Paragon Saber, which means it's entirely possible, and I've had this happen once, you end up with 5 wounds, which is 5 mortal wounds, and then 5 saving throws at minus 4 1 damage. I killed an Orc Warboss on bike, in one round of combat. I've killed... Um, you know, you, you get to a point where you actually overkill things with just the Exarch. And because they're all one damage, you're not affected by the, the minus one damage penalty for things like Wraith Constructs or Disgustingly Resilient. The downside, of course, is that the reason this works so well is the Paragon Saber. It's the combination of the two. The, the rerolls to hit, rerolls to wound, combined with six attacks, combined with mortal wounds... It's the only reason to ever really take the Paragon Saber is Heart Strike. And unfortunately, you can't take it more than once because each Exarch power has to be unique. So I think if you're fielding one squad, like I was using on the weekend at a tournament recently, I ran three Shining Spears with one Paragon Saber and Heart Strike, uh, and Shimmer Shield. This squad's relatively cheap. It punches well above its weight because you can reliably go in and deliver harm to a very specific model thanks to the Mortal Wounds. And the two bodyguards, essentially, which is what they are, absorb firepower and wounds that come in before you start having to take them on the Exarch. Now, all of that stacks into a really, really good place. Three models at 35 points a model is only 105 points. The Paragon Saber is free. The Shuriken Cannon is free. Heart Strike's only 15 points, and the Shimmer Shield's only 5. So you're only paying 125 points for these three models that will just go in and, well, like I say, they'll reliably kill things well past what they should be able to kill. Any extra models gives you a bit more flexibility in what they can do on the table, and you obviously can afford to take a couple of casualties. The downside is, at Leadership 8, they are 2 wounds and Toughness 4 with a 3 up, 5 up, and minus 1 to hit you do have to be mindful that you don't want to be in a position where you lose too many models and then the Exarch essentially auto flees. So they're definitely a candidate for insane bravery as the stratagem if you do end up in that situation. The squad of three worked really well for me because losing two models, I could never fail morale. Now, if all of that weren't enough, we then can go on and use the Relic of the Shrine, Shrine's stratagem for one command point when we're building our army. This gives us access to two unique relics. They can only be applied to Aspect Warriors, and there is only one per shrine, so only one one available for the Shining Spears. But it's a good one. The Shining Spear relic is called Kane's Lance. It's an ornate jet bike that pre projects a potent energy field that blasts a gap in enemy defenses. Now this pairs so well in with the Paragon Saber. 
It only works for the Shining Spear Exarch model, and each time the bearer finishes a charge move, select one enemy unit within engagement range of the bearer and roll 1d6. On a 4+, the enemy unit suffers d3 mortal wounds. That enemy unit is not eligible to fight this phase until after all eligible units from your army have done so. What this is really important to recognize is that it finishes, uh, it happens in the charge phase for starters because it happens when he finishes a charge move. So you have to make sure you get the Exarch into engagement range in the charge phase so he can't be strung out and hiding at the back. But when he does end up in engagement range, 50% of the time he's delivering D3 more mortal wounds and forcing the enemy to fight after all eligible units have done so, essentially fight last. Now this is a double whammy because for things that can only take so many wounds per phase, it actually gives the Shining Spears a really genuine opportunity to take out opposing Phoenix Lords or uh, anything with sort of six or seven wounds with that rule, because you can obviously shoot before you go in, then potentially deliver, 50% of the time, deliver at least one mortal wound, and then deliver more in the assault phase. It's entirely possible to kill a Phoenix Lord in one turn just with these guys really comfortably and having the safety net of Kane's Lance in case you don't quite manage the chip damage you need in the shooting phase it's nice to have I don't think many people can go wrong taking Kane's Lance and be, like I said it does really pair nicely with the Paragon Saber to give you those more, that further mortal wound stacks I could see an argument for putting it in with a Star Lance with um, with so, you know um, using uh, expert lances because obviously it'll give you some mortal wounds in another part of the army which is always beneficial however like i say my unit of three i ran kane's lance on my baragon saber and was never disappointed it's something that you should definitely be considering lastly we're going to take a quick look at some of the stratagems and things that can be really useful for them the first uh, like i've already mentioned was lightning fast reactions for one command point um, this can be used in the shooting phase or the fight phase, and it does mean that you can obviously keep them alive that little bit longer in the fight phase because they are such a limited size, and being hit on threes compared to twos when you're fighting something like an opposing character is very important in case you don't kill them. Feigned Retreat is also one that I use quite extensively with them. For one command point, it allows you to fall back and shoot or charge. For two CP, it lets you do both. Um, the ability to fall back and charge again which obviously then triggers the lance benefits for the squad is really important. It also obviously gets you the fight first rule. So for one CP, it's something that you, it allows you to make sure your Shining Spears don't get bogged down. And because they have the fly keyword, you can't really surround them and lock them in. Moving on to a couple of other stratagems, we have Bladestorm. Bladestorm is one that I've used extensively with Dire Avengers, but if you're going to take more than three Shining Spears, it's one you can consider for them. A squad of five or six has enough Shuriken shots that spending one command point on them which means that an unmodified hit roll of 6 scores an additional hit, can actually give you a surprising amount of firepower from them. Uh, obviously, Bladestorm works really well with Shuriken Cannons as well, and the squad does have one of those because it is free for the Exarch. I don't know why you wouldn't just take the, the Shuriken Cannon every time. There are two unique stratagems, two, um, two different craft worlds that work really well for them. The Beltan stratagem, which is Wrath of the Shrines, for one command point. It only works on Beltan Aspect Warriors until the end of that phase. Each time a model in the unit makes an attack in the shooting or fight phase, an unmodified hit roll of six scores, one additional hit. This is fantastic, again, with a Paragon Saber, because now you're re-rolling to hits and any sixes you get are more exploding attacks, and with a Paragon Saber, that leads to more mortal wounds. So Wrath of the Shrines is one that will allow a unit of Shining Spears, particularly a full squad of six, to go into a much, much stronger model count wise unit and take it out even units that are minus one damage have to be a bit concerned when you go in with 22 or 23 attacks with exploding sixes um, particularly at strength six minus four and uh, you know obviously flat two reduced to one you can still reliably take out you know squads of multi-wound models pretty quickly the last and probably the most straightforward strat that's available to them actually comes from the siam han craft world the Craftwood attribute itself, Wild Host, is great for them. It allows them to reroll foul charge rolls built in, which is so good. It also allows you to declare a charge in a turn in which they fell back. So this is great if you don't have Feigned Retreat. You can still spend the 1 CP so you can fall back, shoot, and then still charge with Wild Host. But this attribute for Shining Spears is just fantastic. 
the the ability for this to just circumvent some of the real limitations of shining spears so that you can't tie them down is great and then we get their stratagem and for one command point warriors of the raging winds allows you to charge even if you advanced so we move 16 and advance 6, so we've got a 22 inch move and then we can still charge and because we're Sime Harm we do get a reroll as well. So if you deploy them relatively close to your leading deployment zone edge, it's entirely possible to turn one charge with this unit. It is only one unit, but my gosh, it's fantastic for when you need to cover ground quickly and still make an impact. Now obviously because of battle focus, all of their assault weapons as well means they can move 22 inches, fire all their shuriken catapults, not the cannon because it is a heavy weapon, um, and then still charge is just an insane amount of pressure in a really short space of time. And I could easily see this being a two or three turn punch where you are able to deliver the first unit with a bunch of fire support and then deliver another unit in turn two guaranteed, potentially both. And then in turn three, you can redeploy into another combat the ability to fall back and still charge again is still there. It just gives so much mobility to the Shining Spears. So that's our Shining Spear discussion for today. I hope you've enjoyed it. I really do think they're worth giving it a try. I've got an army in mind that will feature three full squads of six. And once that happens, you can keep an eye out on the Objective Secured Facebook page and website for my conversation when I actually do put that army on the table. I've got two squads of six so far. Let's see when I can get the third one on the table and we'll go from there. In the meantime, if you'd like to see any particular unit checked out in this series, please let us know in the comments. Otherwise, we'll see you again soon. Thanks for listening.